Welcome back. And in this final session of the conference, we're going to do something in a, a different format. Why, you may ask, because I know you all love the Rusi formats, but the reality is you actually all ask for something a little bit different sometimes. So here we go. This is going to be interesting. It's something different, but also an acknowledgement that there is absolutely no chance that I would be able to succinctly and accurately provide a neat crazy of everything we've discussed over yesterday and today. Indeed, so much of the discussions we've had, including some of the excellent audience questions, to be based on the theme of this balance of investment between offence and defensive systems. Where should the balance lie? Where should the R&D priority sit? How should we calculate that? What methods should we be using to determine those decisions? What are the merits of different force structures? And how won't we help those thinking about investing in systems to start making those decisions? Well, there's only one person who can offer us some insights and help us across all those questions. So I am really delighted to welcome back to Rusi Brad Clark. Brad is the Director of Nuclear Policy in the Office of the SecDev in the US. And for those of you who are not aware what that entails, and there are a few people in the audience who this includes, it means that he oversees policy development, implementation and monitoring for nuclear and missile defence posture, planning and force development. Brad also uh, has responsibility for oversight and policy development in areas of arms control, strategic stability, extended deterrence and allied assurance. It's a seriously significant portfolio. Now, he's worked for the Office of the SecDef since February 2003 in uniform as a consultant and as a DOD civilian. Prior to joining the Nuclear and Missile Defence Office, he served in various positions in the offices of the Rule of Law and Detainee Policy, Special Operations Programme Support and Stability Operations. And then if you go back a bit further in 2003, Brad was assigned to the DOD's uh, Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, no one ever knows what that means, but if you say ORHA, they all understand it. And of course, the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, where he worked on humanitarian issues, human rights and transitional justice issues. Prior to joining the DOD, he was an attorney and a prosecutor in Texas. Now, Brad is a good friend of Roussian, well known to many of the delegates here. And the format of the session is sort of an informal conversation. And we're going to see where it takes us. In addition to that... I've been sent through a whole host of questions already, which I will try to squeeze in at the appropriate point. Uh, and you feel free as an audience, if you want to shoot questions in, please do so using the usual uh, question answer tool in your screens on the Conferencing Plus app. And I will see if I can insert those into our conversation when the opportunity presents itself. Brad, it is really lovely to have you back at Rusi. Thanks so much for joining us and making the time. Uh, hey, it's in entirely my pleasure. Uh I appreciate the invitation. This is one of the highlights of my year every year. So I'm just delighted to be here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting the person you described that had all the answers. So <laughs> I'll see if I can do an approximation of it. Well, Brad, listen, can, can I start with a, a really broad question? Because um, Rusi runs this really strangely popular niche podcast called The Western Way of War. And it relates to precision strike within that. And in a recent episode last week, I was chatting to Arch Macy, and one of the things that struck me was the emergence of precision strikes since sort of maybe the 1980s in the Western way of war. And it, and it really changed how, how we in the West have been fighting. I mean, you take it, you know, from precision strike uh, in um, precision guided munitions in the 1980s in air land battle, you go through shock and awe, you go to uh, MDO, you have the big BMD issues that sit right throughout them. I mean, there's been a huge amount of discussion about how it's changed how we fight but it seems to be reaching a, an inflection point a new way of thinking which is almost centered around precision strike as opposed to a sort of balance with conventional forces a and it feels that perhaps we're getting to a stage where precision strike and, and long-range missiles are going to change perhaps how we organize and fight as a military force perhaps even as a state did you think there's something to that statement or, or do you think Perhaps we're occasionally overhyping it. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think both things are true, right? So I'll, I'll broadly or bravely straddle the fence. And, and so um, I, I think it depends on the stakes, right? And so if you're looking at a war of conquest, 
then precision strike is an aspect of that, but it may not be the most important one, or there may be elements or phases of, of the conflict where it will. But maneuvering to advantage, occupying territory, uh, defeating, you know, sort of, of counterattacks and, and, and those other type of things. But a, a lot of the scenarios that we look on, on the road to war are not so existential, at least not at the beginning, right? And, and so we focus on, on, on more limited sort of objectives, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the Russian concept of deterrent damage, I mean, we would have a different way of phrasing that, but it's, you know, it, it's compelling a termination of the fighting by inflicting some level of punishment. Um, and so strike would be, it would take a higher, I think, prominence in that because that's, that's how you're going to do it, or, or that's at least how you're going to do it with the military instrument, right? There's other instruments you may bring to bear. And so from that perspective, um, you know, I, I think we're right to focus on it. And, and, and of course, the the proliferation, I guess, of the revolution military affairs from from something that that we did in the in the West to to to, to other countries now who have either um, adapted it wholesale or in part prevents some real dilemmas on us that we have to solve. And I think we spent the last two days talking about this. Yeah, I mean, it, there is a you know we've got to say that there is a. A concerted effort, though. I mean, whereas we used to talk at these conferences, maybe five years ago, we'd be focused almost entirely on, you know, strategic range missiles and, and ballistic missile defense. Those are the two things that that really captured our attention. But now we are talking about, you know, the offense defense balance in a different way. We're less talking about, you know, the the, the high yield nuclear capability at one end. And we're more talking about the precision strike that, than we have done before. And it feels as though you know, we are all moving towards it. It's not just, you know, across the US force structures. The UK has, uh, you know, is moving towards long range fires as part of its concept for the deep battle, uh, you know, as is Israel and France. I mean, people are, are starting to engage with this conversation about precision strike and a little bit about the defense offense balance. Although I have the feeling in Europe we're some way behind where the US is in, in making these decisions. Well, right. I mean, I think if you look at sort of the, the what's what's happened or, or one of the, the things that's happened has been the proliferation and the ability to mass intermediate range fires. Right. And, and so I think that's one thing that's different. And and that's created dilemmas for us. And, and, and you know, we sort of have the ability to do that through aircraft and through through sea based fire. Um, and some of our adversaries have as well. But but their mass, particularly in Asia, their ability to mass those fires is getting better. And so how we would prosecute the war from bases or from standoffs, I think, has become more challenging. So we have to focus on this, right? I mean, we have to sort of solve that, whereas we could sort of rely on, on, on basing outside of uh, SSC-7 range, for example, to, to survive some of our, our combat power. Uh, the SSC-8 makes that more difficult. I mean, there's other systems that do as well, but but it gives them a little bit more survivability and more mass. And so... It's that proliferation of intermediate strike, I think, is that the, it has focused a lot of attention because we can't sort of intuitively rely on standoff the same way we used to. And, uh, it's, and it's a, there's a cost balance in there as well, isn't there? Well, there is. I mean, when you bring defense into it, right? I mean, so it's, it's not controversial that you have to defend your force, right? I mean, that, that, that mix of offense and defense has always been there. Uh, it's, it's for whatever reason, when you get into sort of the, the funding things, I mean, offenses, you can see the impact, right? I mean, and I mean that in a literal way as well as rhetorical way. Uh, whereas defense is almost like a cost center, right? And, and, and so, I mean, an, an imperfect analogy is sort of a corporation's legal department. I mean, it's there to prevent damage, but it doesn't produce any profit. It just sucks cost in, right? And, and so it, it's kind of like that. It, it, and, um, so, I mean, I mean that, that's a huge question in, 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 in that balance. And if you want to get into it, I mean, I'm a defense advocate, so, so I don't think we have it right yet. Um, you know, to achieve our operational objectives, we're going to need to, you know, we're going to, we're going to need to, to, to mass and, and generate and sustain our strike. And you can't do that if you don't have a platform or a base to do it from. Right. Uh, but it, it's not, it's, you know, well, coming back to, you know, your first response almost, you know, when we talk about, you know, how you would use 
these systems for a war of conquest, which we're talking less about now. We we sort of we feel on the or more on the defence to maintain a status quo or a status quo ante, right? I mean, that's what we feel like. And yet the evolution of adversary systems, which feels like those systems which are developed for conquest, you know, the Zircon, the, the DF-17, they're, they're designed to be offensive tools in, in many ways. It feels that way. And that makes this, you know, our own balance trickier than before. I mean, it's not only the speed, the hypersonics that they're building, the Russian avant-garde system, their ability to you know, defeat or outmaneuver, or as you've just said, you know, to provide the mass, the scale that overcomes some of our defences. Are we perhaps moving towards a take the archer and not the arrow way of thinking about these in the future? Is that not something that, that we're going down? We sort of feel it coming through in some of the concepts, but not into the doctrine yet. Well, I think that's where we've, we've been, you know, I mean, I mean, that's sort of what we do is we, we attack enemy strike, right? I mean, that, and, and so, so I, I mean, I think you want to do that, but, but the, the way you defend is in depth, right? So, so sure, I mean, we need to suppress enemy offensive capability, and that's the most efficient way to do it, right? If you can take out an air base and the aircraft on it, then you don't have to worry about the munitions and submunitions coming off the platform. Um, but you're not going to get them all, and, 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 and particularly some of the ground systems in the mobile. Well, no, not even that. Um, you know, air bases are relatively resilient, or, or they can be, right? It takes a fair amount of munitions to put them out of order. And if we, as we work on resiliency, we have to imagine our peer and near peer competitors are going to be doing the same thing, right? So, so they're going to be looking at techniques to put their bases back into operation, you know, after a strike, just, just as we will. So, so you do what you can and you do as much as you can there to keep the threat away from where you have to project your strike from. And then you have, um, you know, the outer air battle sort of that space where, um, you know, or the SM3 to SM6 range is another way to put it, right, is where you want to interdict things as they're incoming. And then you've got the close in support. So I think you have to do all those things. Now, the the volume of fire coming in may, may certainly makes you want a preference, you know, counter strike or, or shooting the archer, but it doesn't make it easier, right? And um, so, so you still need, you know, you still need the layers and hypersonics and, and some other technologies make that kind of close in defense or an intermediate range defense more difficult, um, but it doesn't necessarily make it impossible where you throw up your hands and say, we just have to do counter strike. That's the only way to handle the problem. Um, th there's been, you know, considerable success in the evolution of, of precision strike systems. You know, over the, over the last five years, even a couple of days ago, there was a, you know, another great uh, missile test of the um, uh, U.S. Army's ground uh, ground precision system. So everyone is developing these. It, it feels like all of them are reliant on a common ISR sort of systems in terms of that kill chain. And whilst we hear a lot about the, the sort of kinetics of the system itself, the, you know, the, the, the interceptor in defensive terms or, or the missile in terms of the offensive terms, that ISR part of the kill chain is sort of a, a joint problem, right? It's the, it's the integration at a high level. They all rely on the sort of same data. Do you have a... Do you have a good feeling that that's in the right place for the future, or is you know is it owned by the right people? Is, is or is it being pulled? How how are the tensions being dealt with in that ISR you know kill chain system? Well, you're getting a little bit out of my comfort zone there. I mean, from, from, but from what I've seen, I mean, I think I think we've got our minds around the problem now. Um, and, and so, if you had asked me that question three years ago, I would have known less, which is difficult. But uh, uh, but I'd have been a little bit more pessimistic. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're coming closer to that because we're tackling it hard. I mean, one thing that's happened over the last, you know, seven to eight years is, is we've sort of slowly, like turning an ocean liner, turned our attention to some of these problems in, 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 in a departmental way, right? Um, and uh, I mean, you know, the Middle East continues to be relevant despite our, our, our <laughs> most fervent desires. Um, but, uh, you know, we really have, in fits and starts, but increasingly since, since at least 2012, begin turning our attention to this great power conflict idea, making sure, and this is a big element of it, battle management, common operating picture, you know, on the defense side, linking sensors and shooters, so you can, so you can mass and have more efficient defense. We're looking at it, and, and so I think we're getting closer to solutions. 
So uh, I guess it's a useful point because you talk about this continuity and you know, outside of the US, we tend to think of, of a particular, you know, missile, you know, whether it's the nuclear posture review or, or BMD reviews or whatever they are, we, we think about them in terms of administrations. Now, you're someone who's seen a sort of a continuum of this. So, you know, there was a question that came in before this started, you know, how much of the NPR and the sentiment from the Trump administration plans do you think is going to be carried over in terms of precision strike and missile defense? I guess that's wider. It's, it's you, know, you know, since 2003, you've seen this sort of long you know, evolution of it. And there have been, you know, highs and lows and, and movement. But do you feel it's on a sort of it's on an evolutionary continuum that, that actually, you know, there tends to be a, a common set of principles by which every administration abides by? Or do you think there are some distinct differences? Now, there, there are going to be some differences. Now, how those pan out in terms of programs and, and, and sort of operational objectives um, is, is less certain. But I mean, the, the, the clearest example is um, strategic stability was an organizing concept for missile defense in the Obama administration. And I would imagine it will be in the Biden administration. Um, it was not in the Trump administration. Um, you know, it, it was seen more as a, a tool used to thump anything the United States and our allies did to improve our security position if it in some way disadvantaged uh, an, an adversary. Um, now, there's some there's some truth to that. Right. And so we'll, we'll have to we'll have to manage that. Um, but but if you look at it from that perspective, it's it's a it's a it's another way to sort of scrutinize some of the programmatic things that you want to do. Right. Um, and so you'll see probably, you know, so, so the SM3 versus ICBM sort of development is, is really ground zero for that tension. Um, now there's, there's other challenges sort of that program has, which is cost and, you know, how do you, uh, a lot of the European sort of persistent missile defense issues are wrapped up in an underlayer conversation, right? So, so it isn't just a strategic stability thing. It's, 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 there's a lot of other aspects of it. But that's an example where that dynamic comes in. Uh, as, as for carryover, I, I think um, the, the sort of the determination to get at these advanced missile threats, to make regional missile defense a, a priority, um, you know, everything's a priority. So I, I'm not sure it, it, it matters that it's a priority, it's, it, it, but it may not be determinative. Um, but but to prioritize that, um, to, to pay attention to some of these advanced threats, defense against hypersonics, you know, our push into hypersonic systems that came in in a big way in the Trump administration where the, the department decided, you know, this is more than a research project. This is these are things we need to do. Now, INF, although these don't fall under INF, that sort of dynamic kind of fuel uh, that fueled the INF discussion. Um, so I think you'll see some persistence there. Um, and, and part of that is, is, is some of these systems are just necessary to make sure we're adequately defending and can adequately fight through, you know, some of the, the scenarios that we're looking forward to, you know, not looking forward to, but looking forward to seeing in the future. Um, I mean, there was, this has been a, a you know, there's, a, there's been a really big recapitalization in nuclear, for example, which is, which is yeah. still ongoing, right? I mean, that's a, it's an enormous cost outlay, but again, it's one of those necessary decisions. I mean, that's been a, a continuous you know, theme that's that's run across all the administrations, right? It, it has been. I, I mean, I could imagine there'd be some attention on some of the supplemental capabilities that were in the last NPR, but for triad modernization, um, it's yeah, it's been a constant really since 2010 at least, and, and you could go elements of it further back than that. Um, and it's well, I mean, it's it, it's it's there's there. I think there's a pretty strong consensus to modernize it. And, and, you know, you're, you're, you continually review programs, right? I mean, that's you know, to make sure that they're on time, on target, and, and can deliver capability when you need them. And so that's where the analysis is going to be, I think, uh, is to make sure the program is right, not whether you, pers you know, you persist with it or not. Um, and so, so that, in a sense, that's, that's easy, uh, but it is expensive. But there's no, there's no savings there, right? I mean, you know, if you want to save money, you can save a little bit on acquisition. If you buy fewer systems, you know, in, in, in 2035 or 2042, right? I mean, so you're not, you're not, you're not helping your cash flow problem out for a long time by, by doing much different because you, 
you have to you have to buy the first X number of whatever the system is on something like the current scale. And I mean, those 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 discussions are, are really in Europe. I mean, they're, they're in the UK recently over the recent announcement over you know the nuclear posture uh, here and what they're going to do. And France is now just talking about recapitalization of its triad, which you know, there's recent reports about now. I mean, they, they, these are these are problems that are not unique to the US, but the scale of investment is is yeah. just completely different, right? I mean, it's huge, but there is some there is some you know a crossover of some of these discussions with with French and British colleagues, right? Well, there is. I, I mean, we, we face common problems, although it's different. Right? I mean, you know, one issue is is if you reduce a force, can you ever reduce that reduction, or you can ever switch that reduction, right? And and so the UK is going through that right now, and and it shouldn't be something that's insensitive. You know, you, the, the, the size of your force can't be insensitive to what adversaries are doing, right? I mean, and, and, and yet there's, it seems to be a belief that it is. And so, so, so you have to kind of go through that thing. And, and, and uh, you know, one of the points I made in the, in the 2018 NPR came out is it was a test bed on whether you could ever adjust your nuclear forces based on sort of the, what the adversaries are doing. And I think it's still an open question. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and looking ahead, I, I mean, we have to look not only at Russia, but China as well. And, and so China is moving out in a big way. And, and the, 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 the issue of is China, you know, from an analytical point of view, is it a small Russia or a big North Korea, I think it has been answered, right? I mean, you, you have to look at it as a, as a peer near peer competitor in the nuclear dimension as well, at least we'll have to soon. And so what are the implications of that? And that may be more of a U.S. problem, um, but, uh, but not only us. Um, so, so, yeah, we have to get through that. And, and, and uh, I, I just, I mean, we really got spoiled, you know, in, in the 20 years after the Cold War by, by convincing ourselves that this wasn't an issue anymore. And, and it is. And, and, um, and, you know, but we also have to be, uh, I think, balanced in our approach, right? Just because Russia, for example, is increasing the capability of its, its nuclear forces doesn't mean we necessarily have to do anything different, right? Um, you, you know, you need some, you need sufficient for deterrence, and, and there's a pretty robust argument on what's sufficient. I, and and I get that, but 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 I think as you know, as you just pointed out, against Russia, we you know it's a it's a real known quantity. And we sort of figure that out and, you know, and you can make your calculations on uh, on their own ballistic missile defense capability and what that looks like, the, you know, the number of uh, the number of, you know, uh, the payloads that you need in order to deliver what you believe nationally is, is a, you know, a credible deterrent threat. But China is, as you just raised, you know, a, a, an addition to the game. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's it's a, a completely different way of thinking about it. We heard from Michael Kaufman earlier, you know, that, that there was a, the idea that, that in many ways, some of the, I, I want to say lazier analysts who, who just say, well, they, you know, they went, they went to Russian schools and therefore, you know, the, the Chinese think about this in a Russian way is slightly naive, right? There is a very different way that they've been thinking and investing in their rocket forces, including how they organize it. It's it, it's a, it's a completely different sort of ecosystem to become immersed in and understand as a, as a problem for understanding what what you think deterrence matches up, right? No, I, th I think that's exactly right, and, and I think it, it's it's easy to fall into well, they're just doing what the United States and Russia have done, um, or they're just reacting to things that the United States is doing, right? And and so, but it, that's not it at all. They have their own view of the security environment they have their own view of what the threats are to their sort of national aspirations and they are developing their view and their systems that are designed to you know allow them to accomplish their objectives and so um so yeah and and so 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 i mean and that's i mean that's another thing to to, to think about right it's not just you know if x is the number of, of potential warheads that come your way I mean, you'd, you, your, your Chinese warheads and Y is Russian warheads, you know, Z doesn't have, our warheads doesn't have to be X plus Y, right? Um, but we have to think about those things. And one thing, you know, from our perspective, that, that's, that's uh, well, it's not a good thing, but, but it, it, it correlates is, 
you know, as, as we look at sort of China's buildup, you know, for what we've been able to say publicly about it, and you look at what our modernization program, the timing of it, correlates pretty well, right? So as, as, as China builds up, you know, we have decisions we can make with open production lines um, on cruise missiles, you know, in the 2030 timeframe, and ICBMs in the mid to early to mid 30s, uh, submarines, you know, into the 2040s. And, and so we'll have opportunities without heroic efforts, you know, to at least adjust the balance of our forces should a future administration decide to do that. Um, and that also will provide leverages maybe, you know, to capture some of this competition. The fact that we'll have those open lines um, may make it possible to find caps somewhere so we don't have to be building these things still, you know, forever. But uh, uh, so so that that's, I don't know, a happy coincidence, but it's, it, it's you know, the timing works out in a way that we might be able to take advantage of. I just want to throw in one of the questions that's come in as we've been talking, which which is linked to that really, and your idea of you know reuse or or potentially limits, uh, you know. And previously, most of the limitation agreements that we talked about were you know with U.S. Russia in terms of long range strategic systems. Now we have China in the mix as well. We're going to complicate that considerably just in terms of negotiating a, a three-way conversation rather than a two-way conversation but do you feel that there are I mean, lots of analysts have said that you know, it's a very different conversation to have with the Chinese than it is with the Russians you know you know how the Russians are going to address it you know each other's pinch points you know each other's sort of red lines in many ways with the Chinese you're sort of opening a conversation again do you feel that's do you feel that's there or or, or do you feel that there is you know there's there's more opportunity uh, well, I mean, this administration, you know, in the interim national security strategy says they're going to they're going to prioritize this. Right. I mean, we want to avoid co costly arms racing and we want to lead again in, in arms control. So that's going to be administration objective. Now, objectives can be easy and hard. And this is a hard one. Um, so I, I do think there's opportunities there. I, I don't think it's a three way conversation. I think it's two two way conversations. And, and um, because the 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 the. I mean, you can't ignore the disparity of, of the force size today and, and where and, and, or even in 10 years. Right. And, and so that, that makes sort of a, a, a start type thing very difficult, um, you know, and, and then, you know, I, I'm not a Chinese expert, but I'm told that there's a sensitivity there to what are perceived as unequal treaties that are imposed on China. And so that seems reasonable. And, and so, I, I mean, it'd be hard, I think, to impose. Um, uh, numerical limits that were disproportionate, right? And then, but a treaty that doesn't impose, uh, you know, a, a meaningful limit has some of the, it'll draw some of the cur criticism that New Start did that allows China to build up. And so it's not, you know, it's, it's not that useful. And so there's going to have to be other ways. I, I mean, there was an idea of capping, um, which sort of, you know, preserve status quo, you could have, you know, caps somewhere, but that pulls you up against limit things. So, so it's, it's a hard problem. And maybe you make progress on transparency, on data exchanges, on, on crisis communications. I mean, you make progress where you can uh, at a different pace and in different fields as you work on other problems with Russia. Um, and then, you know, sort of the what you can achieve with Russia is, of course, bound on you know, how China's building too, right? So, so all that stuff mixed, but so, you know, I mean, it, it, it may be that a, a avoiding negative outcomes, um, you know, which is, you know, renewed arms racing and, and, and uh, you know, some more, inst you know, development or reliance on less stable deterrent structures is, is the best that can be achieved in the short term. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see, but I mean, I think the administration has committed to getting into this so we'll see what it does i mean it does feel as if there is a you know there is there is renewed interest in new rounds of arms control or at least you know amending supplementing existing agreements you know whatever it feels like it feels like there is now an impetus a drive to to make something happen in this area yeah, no, I think there is. I mean, I think I think the administration is totally sincere when it when it put that point out, and and you know a lot of people are coming back into government that were very con that were very uh, critical of the the past administration on what they termed sort of a dismissive uh, approach to arms control. And, you know, having been in government, I, I I didn't see it quite that way, but but um, um, but certainly the priorities uh, and and the concerns were different. So. 
so yeah, I, I think they'll try. And but it's but it look, I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, you're you're trading. Uh, it's not apples and oranges. It's like apples and sticks. I mean, there's you know different things. And so um, again, you you have to look for where there's commonality of interest and commonality of capability, and there you can sort of maybe accomplish something. Brad, I want to go back to, if we can, just slightly the, the differences between how we see, you know, uh, China and Russia developing their their long range systems in the future, because there's been you know, a lot of uh, a lot of discussion. There's been some broad analysis that says, you know, they, they're going along the same paths. There's been other analysts that say, listen, they're going in completely different directions, right? You know, there's, you know, mobile with Russia has always, you know, majority has been rail based and in the mountains. And then, you know, with the, the Chinese system is going by road. And, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be anything, you know, clear in terms of patterns we see emerging. Now, I don't want you to divulge anything. Interesting. I'm asking, do you think that the, the open source analysis that's out there about, you know, which is still, I'd say, rather confused about which way, you know, is there is there something that's commonalities between Russia and China, or are they definitely now on two different paths? Do you think that that analysis is is about right in long range strategic systems? Um, on on um, on conventional systems, I think there's more commonality than divergence. Um, on nuclear systems, I, I, th I think they're each tailoring their forces for what they view they need, and so for Russia. I think you know their nuclear forces are their military center of gravity, right? I, I, in my view, and 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 um, I mean they they there's a heavy reliance on that, whereas China doesn't have the same reliance, and and I think its its nuclear forces are going to fulfill a different purpose. So although there's common, you know, the, I mean the triad is in part an accident of history, but in part you know the result of some of the best minds of a couple generations trying to solve deterrence problems, right? And so we turn away from it uh, at our peril, but, you know, there, there's something too, you know, something stabilizing about having those different systems. And so it's not surprising that China's pursuing that, right? And, and so, um, so I think they're learning from things that we've done and things that Russia's done, and then they're adapting it to a Chinese context, right? Which, for example, I mean, that's where you see, you know, the, the intermediate range systems, um, you know, most of their problems really other than the United States, or at intermediate ranges. And, and, and so they have a lot more of those in the nuclear context and, and conventional as well than, than we do. So, um, so there's, there's convergence and divergence, I guess. Now, listen, I, I've been given this question, which I feel is, is really unfair because it asks you to sort of forecast in the future in a post-pandemic world where, where you know, budgets slow down. And, but, but it does drive to one of the heart of the questions that I think this, you know, we've had across the two days, which is, the offensive defensive mix, you know, and if push comes to shove, you know, and we're all in the defense community expecting some pain to come out of post pandemic uh, realities of, uh, you know, reduced uh, central expenditure. Do you think you can see, you know, what a defensive offensive mix looks like into, you know, when it's pushed very hard under, under, you know, cost caps, cost constraints, you know, over a five year period, can you see the, a balance emerging or do you think it's going to be, you know, right now that there is, there is nothing to split between them and we're going to be, we're going to be really pushed to, to, to start to have this full discussion in time to, to make the budget. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we can, I think we can get there. I, I mean, look, I mean, at the end of the day, we want crisis stability, right? I mean, we, we want um, to, to have, scenarios that do not demand a military solution, not tempt a military solution, right? And so if you're overweighted on offense, and I think, you know, Brad made this point yesterday, um, then you're overweighted sort of the, the first mover advantage, you know, becomes, becomes an issue. And if, 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 if our counter-strike is so exposed, then we have pressures to, to preempt. And, and so, um, you know, from that, to, from 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 my perspective, you know, missile defenses are, are stabilizing in two directions, right? One, it it removes sort of adversary incentives to go first, right, because you can absorb some level uh, of damage, and it re re removes pressures on the blue forces to preempt. And so, you create a stable situation. And I think you need that, right? I mean, we can't continue to live with 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 huge vulnerabilities, right, in, in our ability to, to to conduct the fight. And so, uh, I think necessity 
um, is going to drive us to a balance. And I think if you listen to Indo-PACOM, I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of lead, and, and, and they're not alone. UCOM's organized and they're thinking around this as well. But, but the public noise is, is, is coming out into PACOM and, and the defense of Guam. And, and so, and that may be a test bed for some of this analysis and, and some of the architectures that we work on. I, I guess one of the other questions that sits back there, I mean, what, you know, you and I could sit here and talk about Russia and China for, you know, for many hours, but there are other players now who are using, you know, intermediate range uh, missiles or short range missiles. Uh, and, you know, we, the, the spotlight has sort of disappeared from, you know, DPRK, uh, where they haven't stood still, right? And so in many ways, analysts' eyes in the open source area have, 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 have come off the ball. Uh, and, and then suddenly where we see, you know, the Houthis using uh, relatively, uh, you know, accurate and, uh, and, and capable uh, long-range missile systems supplied by Iran, or we see DPRK starting to test again, we're suddenly put on the back foot a little bit, right? You know, we, do, do, you, do you feel that there are, um, there's a danger that we become so focused on Russia and China that sometimes we forget uh, that there are other countries out there that are, that at the moment, seem frighteningly willing to use, you know, ballistic missiles particularly, in order to strike everything from critical national infrastructure to, to just assassination attempts. Yeah. So, so I, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, North Korea is, is, is one of the drivers, I, I think of improvement to uh, regional missile defenses. Right. And so, so they, they managed to sort of uh, keep our attention by things like the KN 20 and the 23. And, and, and so, you know, I mean, we, the United States, I, I mean, we don't, the United States really can't sit back and say that's, it's not our issue. And, and because it is, and it's an allied issue and that leads to questions, Hey, what can we do about this? And so that leads to analysis and, and, and system development. Right. Um, I, I'm sort of less informed on, on the uh, kind of the Houthi threat or, or that sort of close in, but I think we're seeing in Israel now that, you know, the, the relevance of defense in that. And again, it comes, you know, it, you have to protect your ability to fight, right? And, 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 you know, your ability to protect your populace as well. And, uh, and so it's, again, that's that concentric defense. And, 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 you know, one of the things that, you know, Israelis do well is, is selectively engage. And, and, uh, um, and I, I'd like to see kind of more of that ability is because as we look at mass fires, particularly if they're ballistic, you know, which ones do we have to engage and can we make that determination? There are, there are some amazing lessons coming out of, uh, of, you know, Iron Dome's ability to deal with mass right now that I think, you know, potentially have, you know, the theoretical transfer into, into what we think about in terms of, you know, whether it's strategic stability or, 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 or whatever else it is. There, there, there is some really interesting stuff. Uh, Uzi's uh, presentation, as ever, was, was brilliant. I don't know if you caught it, but I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about and we've all seen the pictures of, you know, huge numbers of, uh, of strikes coming, coming at them and the ability to defend against mass. And as you say, you know, selectively respond, I think is, is, is really important, right? No, I, I think so. I mean, that's, that's one of the challenges and it pushes you, you know, into something that we maybe haven't paid enough attention to. Although we started, you know, in the 2018 NDS and, and around that timeline paying attention to resiliency and, 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 uh, and you know protracted warfare and, and, and this type of things, right? So, I mean, you can have a very intense missile, you know, salvo exchange, uh, and if you're out of if you're if you're out of bullets, <laughs> you know, seventy two hours into the conflict, what next, right? And, and uh, you know, we know that that our critical infrastructure and certainly our bases and, and, and our platforms are going to be under threat. So, how do you make those more survivable, more resiliency beyond just active defenses, right? And um, and so that in, in a way, I mean, you know, that we're, we're being forced to pay attention to things that, that we weren't paying attention to. Uh, and, and we have, I think, a track record of doing pretty well on things once we focus in on it. Right? Once you focus that lens, you know, a clearer picture starts to emerge and you, you can take action. I, I, I wish we could say we, honestly, but, but you have a better record than us. Uh, I wrote a piece uh, recently about what lessons we can take from the 2011 Libyan conflict, uh, most of which seemed to be about the European paucity of war stocks. And I know 
in many ways, particularly, you know, in, in missiles and munitions, there has been an effort to regain some of that lost, uh, lost ground in terms of war stocks that, that are available. But, you know, for the US to, to learn this lesson, particularly when we're talking about, you know, the salvo sizes that we're thinking about for each of the individual services, particularly in the Pacific, where you have, you know, a lot of, you know, short, intermediate, long range fires, the requirement for that starts to grow really significantly, that actually, we, you know, we get to a stage that, that this becomes a really significant issue in terms of how you develop and sustain your war stocks over over a longer period for a sustained conflict. I think over here we made presumptions in Europe that you know all wars would be nice and short and they would conform to exactly what we wanted. We don't like to look at you know the fact that we didn't do so well in Libya in 2011 and, and 10 years later you know it's still uh, raging quite nicely and the same for uh, Syria that Ukraine is still going on. I mean all our experience is that the, what we hoped for with short wars when you know didn't really exist it's it's not a very reassuring message on this side of the pond i don't think well no i i, I mean it's it's it part of it is and i don't know i wish i had the answer to this i'd have a a, a more responsible position but um <laughs> it, it's you the cost of 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 the platform and, and then the munitions is so great it's hard to achieve mass right and then there's incentives not to have huge stockpiles because the technology is going to move on. And, you know, and, and so I, I think we need to sol solve that somehow. And I, you know, I, I, I want to believe that smart people are working on it. I just, you know, so, cause that makes me, that comforts me. So I'm, I'm going to believe that, but, uh, um, but, but that, I mean, you know, that's this, this idea of protracted war and, and, and sustain things. And I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the deterrence contributions of being able to see, or being of the perception of being able to to fight through the initial phase of a conflict and continue to fight and regenerate forces is enormous, right? It's just enormous, and and if you can do that quickly, uh, but but even better than quickly is assuredly, um, you know, then maybe nobody crosses the, you know, the start line, and, and so uh, at least not deliberately, right? And and you know a deliberate election of conflict is has probably the greatest risk of surprise attack and you know first move and all that other stuff so you know we want to reduce those incentives and, and and you know regenerative capability is one way to do that and, and defensive capability is another right and so and, and and one of the speakers made that point uh yesterday is defenses add to resiliency resiliency and i think that's i think that's exactly right it's a you know re resilience is you know, it is always a, a big question but this idea that you should hold off on making a decision is very attractive to Europeans. Uh, you know, it's no surprise because, you know, you don't actually have to spend the money. We can just say we're waiting. There's always been this particularly, you know, we've seen this in BMD for a long time. Well, we'll be there. Don't worry. We've just got to decide the right time to get into it. We're going to wait for stuff to mature. So whilst I get the idea that AI is going to play a part in yeah. this, particularly in terms of hypersonic decision making, you know, the, the speeds at which you have to react to hypersonics mean, you know, you need AI in it. And that data, you know, relates to that idea of selective engagement. I think that's that's really important. I, I worry a little more when there's a lot of presumptions and assumptions being made uh, on this side of the pond, particularly in Europe, about uh, the the capabilities that will arrive in the short term from direct energy and, and novel munitions, particularly in the idea of defensive systems. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a very it's a very seductive idea, isn't it, that you can just plug something into a nuclear power station and, and endlessly bat out of the sky missiles coming at you, uh, you know, with impunity. It feels it, it feels very science fiction and wonderful, but I, you know, I don't know how much faith you you have in that in terms of not overall, but in terms of time of arrival. Well, it's like drawing to an inside straight, right? I mean, it's 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 risky, and and uh, um, and and the the type of investment that you'd have to make into bringing those systems to fruition, or or to have an opportunity to bring them into fruition quickly, means you're foregoing some other capability, right? And so, you know, if if you want un unmanned aerial systems sooner, then maybe you're not buying F developing F thirty fives, right? And you're relying on four ten. But if six gen never comes, right? You've missed, fit, you know, and and that's a that's, you know, we're not, 
that the governments aren't structured to make those kind of big swinging gambles. I, mean, I, I don't think. I mean, you, you gamble at the margin. Um, so, on, on the other hand, you know, you, you 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 have to fight with what you've got, and and you have to be able to fight effectively. And and one thing too, you know, um, and it kind of counter something I said earlier is, you know, if the if the launch if the platforms are enduring and and and, and last for decades, is you know, VLS tube is a VLS tube, right? And so if you develop a better munition that goes in it. You know, the old stuff still works, right? And, and so you, you find a place for it and you preserve it. So you can build sort of magazine depth that way, even as you iterate to more advanced capabilities. But, but you know, if you, if you just always assume you've got more time to get your defense set, then it's not going to be set. There's, there's always something more beautiful around the corner, isn't there? It's, you know, it's a very seductive thing in capability development is, you know, if, if I can defer the decision for five years, the solution will suddenly appear beautifully for me. Yeah, it's the silver bullet, right? I mean, we do have werewolves to worry about. Um, but, you know, it's, there's, there, the, you got to, you know, you fight with what you have and you can't always bet to come. And so, um, but I, I think you have to pursue it, right? Because, you know, those, those technologies are meant to solve persistent problems, which is, you know, magazine depth and, and cost per intercept. And, and all those are real things that if we solve, then, then you get a, de a defensive advantage. Now, how that defensive advantage translates into crisis stability and other things, we'll have to solve that when we get there. But, um, but it's that push-pull of offense-defense that's sort of enduring over time. So, and this sort of gets me to my final question for you, Brad, which, you know, which is about, I suppose, you know, you have seen a, you know, you've seen a considerable amount of change, but you've also seen a considerable amount of, of, of continuity, you know, I guess, you know, since 2003 and before, you know, you, you, you can, you can walk this line. It's not a straight line, but, you know, you, you can map the dependencies and the changes that come through. I guess what, what we're all looking for is an idea of, not what the continuities are, but what are the drivers for change that sometimes you know we, we don't see or, or we just don't recognize because we're looking somewhere else? Have you seen any things that you think, okay, these are big drivers for change, these are the ones that I need to look out for that actually you know they change nearly everything? I mean, is it is it is it about money? Is it about budgets? Is it is it is it the black swans? You know, are there things that you can identify, or is there nothing? Is is the world just you know, it's the way it is and suck it up. Um, well, so, I mean, money is, is the big unknown. I mean, I don't know what the takeaway from, from COVID spending is, which is either we don't have any money for defense anymore or we have an unlimited supply of money and we can, right? And so, <laughs> um, you know, we could have funded a lot of defense budgets with some of the stimulus funding. So I, I don't know what that answer is. Now, we've been through tough times before. I mean, the BCA, when we were under the Budget Control Act at the department, you know, that forced some, uh, some, from, some very difficult trade-offs. And, and, and what you get, I think, when, when you get to flat or declining budgets, you know, the risk is um, that you can't make the, you can't prioritize effectively or you can't prioritize at all. And so you end up with a bunch of broken programs. Right. And and, um, and and then you have to dig out from that. And, and there was some of that in the nuclear modernization thing. Right. Is, you know, it wasn't funded where it needed to be for a period of time. And then we had to recapitalize very quickly when we came out of it. Um, and, you know, we were able to do that. But, you know, if you the longer you're under those kind of constraints, the harder, of course, that is, you know, to catch up for, for every part. So we have to go through that. So. But when we look at sort of game changers, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, my imagination might not be up to the task of, of that. I mean, you know, to, to, to me on, on this, on the strike issue, right, you know, the two things, one of which we talked about, which is, um, you know, the, the ability of adversaries to mass intermediate range fires and, and the impact that has for, for our ability to stand off to achieve our objectives. I think that's, that's the problem that we're working through now. And, and another game changer, I think, that may help us solve that is, is, the, is, is the INF treaty, you know, the, the end of that. And, and while we were under the treaty, um, you know, even with Russia's cheating, you, you know, the, 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 the question was, is, is, is the, you know, can, can you live with um, some level of surreptitious covert Russian cheating 
to maintain sort of stability. And I think, but for China, we probably, or I don't know, probably, but we may have answered that yes, right? Is that, you know, it's better that we don't have competition in this space and we just suck up a little bit of what they're doing underneath. Although there, there's a lot of political problems with that, but but from a strategic problem, okay. But but with, we just didn't have the luxury to do that given what China was doing in the Pacific. And so by by sort of unleashing us from that constraint, you know, we can create new operational dilemmas for China, which I think will be stabilizing in the long term. And then an unknown to that is, I think that also frees up allies to pursue, you know, the, those type of systems. Um, and, you know, that's not something we've ever really encouraged. Um, you know, the United States have really encouraged, at least not to my knowledge. But I think there'll be a momentum in that direction because there's just obvious deterrent and, and war fighting advantages to these systems that other countries are going to want to have. And, and uh, you know, North Korea is a driver of some of that thinking in Asia right now. Um, so, so I think that's, that's something to keep an eye on. Is it, and, and maybe it's a hedging problem. Um, uh, I, I don't know, but, but I think that's something to pay attention to. Brad, listen, we're running out of time. We, I can't believe we've been talking for nearly an hour already, uh, and uh, and I could just keep going forever. It, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, a real pleasure to round out the conference in this way. Uh, absolutely. I really appreciate the invite. Thanks, Pete. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting you back in London and taking you for a pint of warm ale somewhere, uh, hopefully at next year sometime. That would be great. Uh, listen, we're so pleased that you as delegates chose to join us for this conference as well. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, some of whom got up at ridiculous hours of the day uh, to join us, to our chairs as well for doing their job so well in holding everyone to account, to our sponsors, the organising team at RUSI, and critically, thanks to you, our delegates, for being such an engaged and enlightened audience. I'm really aware that these remote conferencing tools that you see you know, they've got their limitations. We all miss interacting with you. Just seeing your question somehow isn't enough. We're finding that we need to work on ways of bringing your voice to the sessions in a better way than we do right now. It's just not good enough. So, for example, on the 26th of May, you can still register for our UK Strategic Command Conference when we're talking about multi-domain integration, uh, whatever that is, and the recent Defence Command paper. The speaker lineup is phenomenal, as you'd expect, for the first opportunity for MOD to go over its messages since the publication of the UK's integrated review, the Defence Command paper, and the Defence and Security Industrial Strategy earlier this year. And you can expect us at RUSI to really start to interrogate what those decisions mean and maybe even find some in the UK MOD who can talk English. The day after that, on the 27th of May, we're hosting our annual United Nations Peacekeeping Conference in association with the UN Association in London. There's an incredibly diverse speaker array lined up for an equally challenging agenda. Again, you can register for that one online. The conferencing tool, I said, is evolving and we'll be using this conferencing platform for those conferences. But part of those conferences will have a blend of virtual and physical attendance. And we're working hard to keep improving those outputs. We'd welcome your feedback on all of this stuff. Please send it through either an email to me, to the events team. There's a, 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 an application within the C plus tool that you can do, but please send it in and we'll keep working hard. But we also need to acknowledge that using remote broadcasting makes our content and debate more accessible for those traditionally outside the metropolitan audiences. And that's really refreshing from us, not just hearing from the urbanites, but also hearing uh, from those further afield who want to interact with us, not just in the UK, but globally. Within 15 months, the RUSI headquarters in London will be different to anything we've had before. And I look forward to welcoming you all to the Institute virtually or in person as soon as the opportunity allows. In the meantime, and alongside our membership team, we've big plans to expand the diversity and size of our membership base, reaching out to new universities beyond the red bricks, to new industries and to different audiences. Our digital products are now reaching more than 100,000 people across 130 states, and we've been welcoming hundreds of new members during lockdown who are seeing the value of RUSI research and conversations. You're part of this offer. Think about coming to join us and being part of a refreshed, re-energized, renewed conversation in national security at the Prospect Magazine Think Tank of the Year. 
We all have some responsibility to be part of a changing defence and security dialogue and to be the catalyst for change. But thank you so much for joining us over the past couple of days. We feel blessed by your presence. And from all of us at RUSI, enjoy the rest of your day and the forthcoming weekend. Goodbye. Thank you.